All right, let's turn now to John chapter 11, verses 14 through 44. John chapter 11, verses 14 through 44. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she had gotten up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away, he said. But Lord, Martha, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believed? you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Wow, take off those grave clothes and let him go. God, today we ask that you would take off those things that would keep us from moving forward into the fullness of life that you have given us. We ask that you would remove the strips that have bound us. And we ask, God, that we be set free 
to believe that you are who you say that you are and live into that in the fullness. So open our ears that we may hear, open our eyes that we may see you, open our hearts that we may believe, touch our will that we may follow. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the reading that we have for today is a powerful reading. It's one that is familiar uh, to many. Um, and as I began to study and prepare for this and then wrestle with this more and more, uh, the deeper I got. And so I thought, okay, let me stop now and let me back up and let's go and let's build the context so that we can understand truly the fullness of the meaning. And as I began to look at the context of this scripture, I realized, ah, there's something that needs to be laid before we move into John 11. So I want to look at today the seven I am statements that Jesus made because what he does in chapter 11 is all about believing in him. He asks, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Yes. But then when he said, well, roll the stone away. Well, wait, 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 wait. He's been in there for four days. It smells really bad. Why would you want to do that? Did I not just tell you I am the resurrection and the life? And that he who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live? Even though those words had been spoken, there was an issue around believing. People heard, but they weren't yet believing. And so as we, as we go to the context uh, in chapter 10, I just want, I want to revisit that because it's so important that the miracles of God, that they happen, that we might believe. And sometimes we say we believe, but we don't behave like we believe. And so I want to look at what Jesus says about himself, and I want us to reflect on what he says and who Jesus is and what do we believe. Even though Jesus had grown up uh, with the people that he was around, even though he went to the same schools, he grew up in the same temple, he had the same teachers, he went through the same rabbi school as the other rabbis, even though he also was affirmed and adorned as a rabbi, even though he probably even worked on some of the houses that, uh, that were built and that were in the community because he was a carpenter, people still weren't quite sure who he was. But the question is, is why? I mean, if you see somebody in school every day, you kind of have a good sense of who they are. Right? If you see them at the local restaurants, if you see them at the shopping mall, if you sit down and break bread with them, you, you generally have a good sense of who they are. But, but some said that it was because he understood things like no other. Yeah, they kind of knew him, but, but how is it that he knows those things that we don't know? Jesus could explain things in a way like nobody else could. Well, why is it that he can explain things in such a way that opens our eyes to deep things that we've never seen. Jesus taught as one with authority, some people said. And it must have been an incredible authority because they were used to teachers teaching. But somehow what he said, it just, it made sense and it was transformational in how he said what he said. He said that he was the one who came now to fulfill the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah, that he had come to proclaim the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the Lord's favor. He said, that is who I am. That's what I've come to do. Jesus spoke to them at different times about who he was. 
And yet, some people really struggled with seeing him for who he was and for accepting him for who he was. Jesus said these seven things about himself in the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And the Jews who heard these words, the Bible says that they were divided in John 10, 19. They were divided, and many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can demons open the eyes of the blind? So why were they so confused about who Jesus was? When he spoke to them plainly of who he was, he spoke to them in parables about who he was, and he also demonstrated who he was. In chapter 10, verse 22, when Jesus was at the festival of dedication, which we also know it as Hanukkah, the Jews were there and they were gathered around him and they were saying, look, just tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus told them, I have already told you, but you're not willing to believe. So he said, well, if you don't believe what I have said about myself, then at least believe the works that I do in my Father's name and let them testify about me. So let's stop and let's think about some of the things that Jesus did. Can a normal person without the help of God feed 5,000 people with a fish dinner? One? No. Huh. Well, can a normal man without the help of God make a little spittle on the ground with mud, put it on someone's eyes, and they see again? No, that just makes a little bit of a mud puddle. <laughs> right? Can a normal person without the help of God tell me everything about my life, my past relationships, my marriages, the person who I'm living with now? Can a normal person have that kind of word of knowledge about me without some kind of supernatural help? No. What Jesus was telling them, even in verse 30 of chapter 10, is that I and the Father are, are one. He wasn't saying um, that he himself was God. That's not the point that he was trying to make. What he was saying is that I'm so in step with the Father that, that when the Father says, speak this in my name, that he speaks that. When the Father shows him a vision and says, reach down and touch touch." the mud and put it on their eyes. When he sees that, he does what he sees the Father doing and that it comes to pass. He's saying, I'm so in sync with him that when he speaks, I speak. And I'm so in sync with him that when he shows me a vision about your life, I can tell you about your life. I'm so in sync with him. I and the Father, we're one. We're, you know, we are, we are one because as his disciple, I am doing everything on his behalf. So, Yes, I am just the person that you grew up with, but I'm more. If we think back to his baptism, we remember that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and that was the power of God to be the representative of God. Today, I just want to diverge just for a moment to just say that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, that is the power of God coming upon us so that we too may be the agents of God in the world. That one was free. Okay, back now to the sermon. So 
It's important that we understand that Jesus was just a normal human being, but he had supernatural anointing to represent God in the world. He was fully divine because his father was divine, but when he was born into the world, he was born with the limitations of humanity just like we are. That's why we hear in the scriptures that he said that he, even though he was equal to God, he did not count himself as equal to God, right? But he humbled himself so that he would be able to know our experience, operate as we do, die as we will, and then show us what it means to be the first fruit of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we find ourselves here. And Jesus is always saying things about himself. He's always doing things that, that represent who he is and who he represents. He's always telling people that he does the things that he does in the name of the Father, that the Father might be glorified, that people will know that he was sent by God. And yet people still, they had a hard time believing who he was. So why were they confused? Well, I'm going to tell you why I think they were confused. I think it's because believing in Jesus takes faith. Believing in Jesus is not something that we come to out of our logical minds as much as it is what we choose to believe by faith. I choose to believe by faith that this stool will hold me if I sit on it. Now, I don't have any proof of that, but I have faith that if I sit on it, that I won't fall. I am now sitting on it and I have not fallen. But that was an act of faith. And to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, is an act of faith. We have to believe that what he says is true. And then because we believe it, then we can begin to experience all that he has to say to us and all that he wants to do in our lives. I think that when we choose to believe in Jesus by faith and desire to believe that he is who he says he is, that that's the key to us getting to know him for ourselves. Jesus had gone around pro proclaiming the good news to the poor. And to everyone who was poor in spirit, desiring to be close to God, they started to begin to understand better who God was and to experience him. Jesus went around healing the sick. And the people who were sick, who went to him in faith, believing that he was a healer, they were made well. Jesus went around giving sight to the blind. And I can only imagine that those who were physically blind, when they were able to see, that they rejoiced in Jesus, who was the Messiah, the Savior sent by God the Father to bless them. He healed the brokenhearted. He set the captives free. What does it mean to be a captive? You know, when I was younger, I used to wonder, you know, what does that mean? I don't, I, I like this part of the Bible, but what does it mean that, that, he, that he heals the broken heart, accepts the captives free, delivers um, the imprisoned? What does that mean? Does that mean that he goes in and he opens the jails and that everybody who is in jail gets to come out? Okay, I don't know. I was naive. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't understand. But I believed it by faith, even though I didn't understand it. Now, I know that the jails are still filled with people, but I also believe that what he said was true. And that's how it is for us. We can believe God without understanding everything that God says. But as we continue to pursue God, then things will begin to open up to us as we are able. And later on, I started to learn, oh, what does it mean to have a broken heart? You know those things that really disappointed you? Broken heart. The way that that friend betrayed you? broken heart. The way that that situation didn't work out, hurt. Jesus said he came to heal us from those, to heal the brokenhearted if we would allow him to. What does it mean that he came to set the captives free? Well, sometimes people do things against us and it hurts us. I mean, it wounds us. 
It messes us up. We are not the same. It's not something that we did, but it was something that someone did to us. And then we became stuck. We became a captive by that situation. And oftentimes what keeps us captive is that after that bad thing happens to us, we are not able to forgive. We are not able to recognize that it happened at a point of time, but now we are able to move forward. Sometimes we are, are captive because people continue to do things against us and to us that keeps us bound. Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. Well, hallelujah. How are you going to do that, Jesus? Well, he does it by helping us to forgive because immediately we are able to be set free from many things just through the work of forgiveness. Sometimes people will be captives all their lives because somebody did something that they didn't like and they wouldn't forgive. And because they didn't forgive that person, then they won't forgive that person and they begin to live a life of unforgiveness. If you do this to me, I'm not gonna forgive you. I, I might forgive, but I won't forget. Nope, I'm not even gonna forgive, right? But when we are captive by what other people do to us, Jesus said, I came to walk you out of that and to bring you healing. Jesus said, I came to set free those who have been in prison. That has to do with the sins that we actually commit. Do I continue to tell lies? Do I continue to lie and then I have to lie after that lie to make sure that I don't get caught in the lie that I told before? Do I continue to... Um, to do other things that are wrong? Do I kill people with my words or with my hands? Do I, uh, do I embezzle money? Do I, um, do I get into pornography and that's my, my way of escape? What is it that I continue to do even though I know that I ought not do it? And if I continue to do it, make excuses for it, then I am putting myself in bondage in prison because the, the demons of this world, they want to trap you in a place that, of sin so that you cannot commune fully with God. So if you decide that it's okay, you know, for you to cuss at people when they do something wrong to you, then you have given yourself, you've, you've opened up a doorway, you've given yourself over into that behavior. Now, you can't respond in a godly way because you've already decided that when that happens, you're going to respond in an ungodly way. That puts you in prison. And now you have given the enemy the right to just, hey, you st first you used to just cuss at little old ladies, you know, when they were too slow walking across the street. Now you cuss at everybody who doesn't do what you want them to do, right? And it gets worse and worse and worse because you have given yourself a new identity an identity of unrighteousness, and it imprisons you. People say, oh, that's just the way he is. No, that's the way he's chosen to become because God did not birth you that way. You learned how to be that way. And as you agree with that negative behavior, then you become what that negative behavior brings about, right? As a man thinketh, so is he. And so Jesus said, I came to set people who are in bondage free, right? And so Jesus came to do all of these things, and we see examples in the scriptures about how he did these things. The people for whom he touched, their lives were transformed. And why? Because they believed. They believed that he was who he says that he was and is. And I wonder today if we truly believe that Jesus wants to continue to be that same Jesus for us. You can walk in churches and sometimes I've heard it said, wow, well, people in church are just as bad as people in the world. <laughs> they don't do anything differently than I do, right? Not only when I cut them do they bleed, but if I step on their foot, they curse. <laughs> okay, that was a little church humor. Go ahead, just thank you very much for that laughter, right? I guess what I'm saying to you is that if we fill the churches, but we never believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he'll do for us what he says he'll do for us, then we will stay imprisoned and captives with broken hearts 
never transformed. We can believe with our minds that he is who he says he is, but our lives will continue to be like dressed up garbage cans, looking good on the outside, but all trashy on the inside, and it will come out. The question is, who do we believe that he is? Do we believe that he is who he says that he is? And do we believe it by faith, or are we simply hearing it with our minds. Throughout the 40 days of Lent, our journey is to help us to get to know who Jesus is by reflecting on his words. And not only that, by opening our hearts and daring to say, I believe. I believe. And where we don't have enough belief, then help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I want to know you as the one who heals my broken heart. I don't want to be sad anymore. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I don't want to be, I don't want to be any of that anymore. I want to be, I want to be good. I want to be whole. I want to be healed, right? Can we believe that he is who he says that he is? The kind and the quality of life that we will experience depends on who we think Jesus is and what we believe that Jesus can do. Let me say that again. The kind and quality of life that we will have depends on who we think Jesus is and what we believe that Jesus can do. If you don't think that Jesus can help you in your situation, then you are setting yourself up for him not to be able to help you because you won't receive that which he is giving you. You won't follow his lead to be able to experience what he says that you can have. But let's just think about it. The woman with the issue of blood believed he was a healer. She didn't stop pressing through, going through people, going through every obstacle until she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed after 18 long years of bleeding. The lepers who had been outcast, they were living on the, the edges of town. But when they heard that Jesus was coming, they made their way to Jesus and all 10 of them were healed as they walked away. They believed that he could restore their identity and their dignity and heal them, and he did. The man who was sick had his friends believing for him he was laying on that mat, couldn't go anywhere, but their faith that if they could just get him to church, if they could get him to that church meeting that was in that house, if they could just, look, cut a hole, there's no other room, lower him down. If they could just get him to Jesus, they knew that not only would he believe, but he would be healed. And he was. Who we believe he is and what we believe that he can do for us makes all the difference. Who do you believe that Jesus is? As we come to a close today with this message, I want you to think about where you are in your life right now. What are you facing? What does Jesus say about himself that you need to believe? Are you spiritually weary? He is the bread of life. Are you not quite sure what to do or you're confused, frustrated in your mind? He is the light of the world. You can trust in him. Are you feeling downcast and outcast? Are you feeling like you're not accepted, that you're rejected? Are you feeling like you don't really know where you belong or where you fit? Jesus said, I am the gate that allows you to move into the kingdom of God. Are you in need of someone to help you to continue in the ways of righteousness, 
to continue on your journey. He says, I am the good shepherd. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're at the brink of death. Maybe something that you're going through is about to die. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe him? If you need your life to be abundant, you've lost your job, you've lost your income, you, your, your, your service life has been decreased by this COVID and you can't find ways to be fulfilled in what you do. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If I abide in you and you abide in me, you will be fruitful. Do you believe this? Who is Jesus to you? What will you allow him to be for you today? The good news is that he is that. He is whatever you need. He is whatever you need because God sent him to be the answer to our prayers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, we want to thank you today for sending Jesus. We want to thank you today that as we believe that he is who you said he was, that as we believe by faith that he is who he said he was, if we believe that he came to give us abundant life and all that we need, and then if we are willing to open our hearts and let him be that, to trust him to be that, that we will be able to experience the good news that you have sent to us in Jesus Christ. And that good news was for yesterday, for today and forevermore. Help us to believe in who Jesus is and help our unbelief. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or you've never accepted him as one who can be the answer to your life's prayers, we invite you to choose him today. You will never be disappointed. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you today for everyone who chooses to believe in God, to believe in Jesus as their Lord and their Savior today for the first time or even again. We pray that you would help them now to truly repent for their sins, to confess and to be sorry. We ask, Lord, that you would help them then to invite Jesus into their hearts, to be their Lord and Savior. We invite you, Lord God, then to fill them with the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit says, come, the church says, come. Everyone who will, come and receive Christ today. We thank you, God, that now those who've prayed that prayer or rededicated their lives, that they are in the fold and they will now know you for all of who you are as they journey with you. We thank you and we welcome you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.